open up your Bible to 1 Samuel, please. I want someone, could I have a volunteer to open their Bible to Amos, the book of Amos, 8th chapter. Somebody will do that? Would you do it, Sue? Amos 8, 11. Okay. No, I'm going to ha- I'm going to start in Samuel first and then we're going to go to Amos. And then we'll go to Andy, Amos and Andy. No. <laughs> all right. We're all at, in 1 Samuel third chapter, Samuel's call. We're going to get into the history of everything, but uh, I want to focus on the third chapter in 1 Samuel. The boy Samuel served the Lord in Eli's presence. In those days, the word of the Lord Lord was, was rare, and prophetic visions were not widespread. One day, Eli, whose eyesight was failing, was lying in his room before the lamp of God had gone out. Samuel was lying down in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was located. Then the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here I am, and he ran to Eli. Here I am. You called me, Eli? I didn't call, Eli said. Go and lie down. So he went and lay down. Once again, the Lord called Samuel. Samuel got up, went to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. I didn't call you, my son, he replied. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel had not yet experienced the Lord because the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Once again, for the third time, the Lord called Samuel. He got up, went to Eli, and said, You called me, here I am. Then Eli finally understood that the Lord was calling the boy. He told Samuel, Go and lie down, and if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lied down in his place. And the Lord came, stood there, and called as before, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel responded, Speak, for your servant is listening. The Lord said to Samuel, I am about to do something in Israel that everyone who hears about it will shudder. On that day, I will carry out against Eli everything that I had about his family from beginning to end. I told him that I was going to judge his family forever because of the iniquity he shows he knows about. His sons are defiling the sanctuary and he has not stopped them. Therefore, I have sworn to Eli's family, the iniquity of Eli's family will never be wiped out by either sacrifice or offering. I'm going to stop there because I want to give you a little bit of, of background. <coughs> Excuse me. It was a time in the history of Israel where there was not much being said from the mouth of God. So read that quote from Amos, please. Amos was a contemporary prophet of um, of Isaiah. Go ahead. I think so, yeah. Amen. The Lord says, I, behold, I'm sending a famine in the land where people are starving to hear the word of God. Not bread, you know, not water, but hearing the word of God. I, I think about our own country and how true that is for us today. People are starving to hear the word of God. And what's happening so many times is we're giving them uh, an, ema- in an emaciated word of God, not with, with full with power and understanding. And so uh, there are so many of us, you know, we think we're trying not to offend anybody and and people are starving to hear the real word of God. It's a very sobering thought. The background, most of you know the story of Samuel, but I want to go over it for those that maybe have forgotten. And uh, Peyton's not here. I was going to, I was going to. Uh, make Peyton preach the word, but because uh, um, I know Peyton knows all about Samuel, so 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 Samuel is the son of Hannah and Elkanah, and um, and the story of Samuel's birth is very important. And uh, let me just tell you, Hannah was a wonderful woman. She was dedicated to her husband. Her husband had two wives, and uh, uh, Hannah was the first, and he loved Hannah very, very much. But Hannah couldn't conceive. And so wife number two comes around, and of course, she gets pregnant right away, and so she 
parades that in front of Hannah, making Hannah feel even worse. And so Hannah goes uh, uh, to pray before God. And she is so, I mean, anybody who, anybody here ever been desperate for God? Have you ever been desperate? Raise your hand if you've ever been desperate. And my hand went up too. Hannah is desperate for God. She can't take it anymore. She loves her husband, but she can't take it anymore that this other woman would parade the sun in front of her and, you know, na 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 na. We women would never do that, would we? Yeah, right. You know? And so Hannah goes before the Lord and she's weeping and crying. The high priest is Eli who we're going to read a little bit more about. We heard about him a little bit in the in the first few verses I read. Eli's the high priest. He sees this woman out of control crying. And he is offended. He thinks she's drunk. She's crying out to the Lord. She is beside herself. Finally, finally, he realizes that she's calling out to God. The Lord hears Hannah's prayer. And she conceives. Hannah makes a promise that if she has a child, she will dedicate that child as a Nazarite and that child would be in service to Almighty God. And here comes Samuel. Samuel is born and uh, stayed with his mom and dad for a while. There's some discrepancy, controversy about how old was he when he went to live at the, at the tabernacle with Eli. <coughs> but... He was a child. He was probably around five or six. Some go as young as four. Others say as old as seven or eight or whatever. But he was a child. And he went to to stay with Eli, the high priest. Eli, the high priest, had been a priest for a very, very long time. He had two sons. And both of his sons were not following God at all. They were carousing with the women uh, that had come to to pray before the Lord. They were eating the food that was was being being brought with debauchery and just filling their face. Eli himself was getting fat at the altar of God. Yet Eli was the high priest. It's interesting that when Samuel comes, he has a room just off the temple, uh, uh, off the tabernacle. And he's there. He's going to open up the the tabernacle for prayer in the morning. He's going to light the candles and put them out when they have to be put out and all those little things. He's learning to serve the Lord. God was very disappointed in Eli. He had had this position for a long, long time. But you see, he became complacent. He became not wanting to hear the truth about his kids. He didn't um, follow the the call of God that he, he should have maintained the sanctity of the tabernacle. He did not. And there in the very presence of the Lord and the Ark of the Covenant, all of this was going on and Eli did nothing. Except, and you could see it even in this exchange that I read, so the Lord speaks to Samuel, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel has not heard the Lord's voice before. It's the calling of Samuel. I love Samuel. When you read the story of Samuel, it's an amazing story. Samuel has never heard the voice call him, the Lord's voice call him before. He thinks it's Eli. He goes to see Eli. I'm here. What do you want, Eli? Eli, it takes Eli three times to go, Hey, if I didn't call him, maybe it was God, you know. But that's how far Eli had, had become insulated in his own world. He couldn't hear the voice of God at all. He probably went through all the duties he was supposed to do, but he had lost touch with the voice of Almighty God. When we read the, the, uh, the, the passage from Amos, how the voice of God was silent. We hear about a time when people stopped hearing God's voice. It was a terrible time. Imagine us today. Now we, of course, we have uh, such grace has been given to us. But I want you to know that we are a similar people. 
You know, we go to church every Sunday. In preparing this message, I was challenged. We go to church every Sunday. We do basically the same routine. We sit in our basic seats. (laughs) Unless there's a visitor and we don't try to make them feel uncomfortable, but we sit as close as we can to where we usually sit. (laughs) But we come and we get used to the routine. We get used to the way things are. I want to challenge us this morning. Are we hearing the voice of God? Do we know, do we hear the voice of God? Do we know it's the Lord himself that speaks to us? The voice calls out to Samuel. Samuel, Samuel, double time his name. Twice he uses his name. Samuel, Samuel. It is an important point. He did that with Abraham. He did this with Moses. People who were about to change the course of history. Moses, Moses, wake up. Abraham, Abraham. And now he says, Samuel, Samuel. It's a kid. And the Lord begins to speak. And it's at this point where the anointing of Samuel really happens. He's just a kid. But he says to the Lord, here am I. What is it that you want me to do? Have you heard the voice of the Lord? Have I heard the voice of the Lord calling us? God's still at work in in our lives. God is at work today in our country, in our community, in this church. But are we hearing the voice of God? Or are we so cluttered in our mind, in our life, that we can't even hear God? That God becomes muffled, you know, sort of like being on the other side of a wall, you know. You ever, you ever been in a hotel room and you hear voices on the other room, you know? Do you do this? (laughs) Like this, you do this. But that's how we're hearing the voice of God many times. It's muffled, it's not clear. So much is filling our life other than the voice of God. I'm telling you, we need to challenge ourselves every day. Who are we hearing? And how are we hearing it? Are we hearing it without, without earmuffs on? Are we hearing it clearly? Is, what is our response to the voice of God? Sometimes we listen to God through the, through the voice of our paycheck. Give that person 20 bucks. Well, I didn't go to the ATM. All I got is a 20. That can't be you, God. Sometimes we hear the voice of God through our work. Don't bring up prayer meeting because they'll think you're weirdo. So we say nothing. We deny the hope that God wants to bring to that individual because we don't feel comfortable. So many times we allow the outside world, the world that has nothing to do with Jesus Christ, influence us in how we live our daily life. Oh. Hearing the voice of God. Hearing the voice of God. We let things creep in. <laughs> Excuse me. I got to... I got to... I'm not sure... Do you know where Peyton is? Oh, she's probably outside. Oh, she's outside. She's in the back. Oh, okay. I think she's resting. Uh, <laughs> um, but when Peyton was a little kid, when Peyton was a little kid, I can tell you because she's back there. I don't think she'll hear me. But when Peyton was a little kid and her mother and I would be talking, Peyton would be going like this, Ma, Ma, Ma. And I'd be like, so Sue, this and this. Ma, 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 Ma. Ma. See, that's almost like our lives. The outside world comes in and gets us distracted. And Sue knew she had to say, What is it, Peyton? Could I have another piece of broccoli? Yes, eat the broccoli, you know? Go, we weren't going to be able to finish our conversation. But you see, that's exactly what Satan does to us. He gets us distracted from what we're doing. 
He gets us distracted from our dedication to the Lord. He All he has to do is get us off track. Somebody says to us, something to us, all of a sudden he, we have a problem and we're, we're, we've got a bad attitude. We're, you know, talking about somebody. We're mad. We're doing whatever. Get us off track. All he's got to do is that and we miss the voice of God. We miss what the Lord wants to do for others through us. And then we come to church and we're like, oh, Jesus is so good. Yeah, amen. I lo- couldn't live without him. Right. But w- are you hearing his voice? And are you being obedient to the voice of God? Am I? Or do I allow myself to be distracted every time I'm walking with God? You know, this was about a huge change. God was about to end the reign of Levi, I, 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 Eli, and and the ju- the time of the judges was about to end. Samuel is the last judge. The people cry out, they don't want judges anymore to rule them. They don't want the judges to to judge with the knowledge and the and the um, uh, the uh, wisdom of God. They want a king like all the other nations. It's happening right here. And Samuel is right there. Samuel is called in not a few chapters down that he is going to anoint the first king of Israel, King Saul. Prior to Saul, the land was judged by the judges. Samuel was the last judge. When God calls us, it's not because he's got something frivolous for us. When there is a calling and you hear the voice of God, it's because there's something major happening in your life and perhaps in the situation that you find yourselves, an individual or a circumstance that you find yourselves, or who knows, maybe like Samuel, changing the whole direction of a community. You never know what God has planned. But if we are not in the position to hear the unadulterated word of God, we're never going to change. And the people around us are never going to change. We can jump it up and down and bring tons of offerings and, and, uh, and say, God, why are you moving? I've been praying for these people forever. Why aren't you moving? Why aren't we listening? Why aren't we listening? God has something so important for us. It's a time for us to empty ourselves of all of this influence of everything that's going and listen to the call of Christ you know when I was younger I was in a uh, a couple of musicals and uh, did some plays and one of the musicals I was in for a couple of I did it a few times was Godspell and it's a story of Jesus and it was you know kind of hokey and stuff but back in the 70s we thought it was like you know pure it was such pure theater but um, but it opens up the the musical uh, opens up if you ever see the actual show it opens up and there's a statue of Nietzsche over here and there's uh, all these uh, philosophers all over on the stage they're all dressed in costumes like with you know Greek philosophers and stuff they're on the stage and the musical starts and they all start singing a different song and the, all these different words start coming out and so it's a big concophonous mess you can't understand any of it you don't know what Nietzsche's saying you don't know you know what uh, Tehar did did Jordan is saying you don't know what any of these guys are saying <coughs> and just as the music gets so weird and loud and, and awful to your ears there comes the sound of the shofar and it silences them the sound of the shofar is the voice of God breaking through all of that the sound of the shofar resounds the voice of God. The voice of Almighty God is beginning to speak. And that's when, that's when the story of Jesus, it's when Jesus begins his public ministry. Then this, the, the musical continues. Out of all the music, out of all of the scenes, out of everything, that was the most important thing that I ever heard. That God wants to break through those voices in our lives those things that keep us from following him 
We are, we are the children of God. And if we can't listen, if we can't hear the voice of God, what, what will he do? I, I want to just share a couple of things. Eli lost his discernment. He refused his responsibility and he became complacent. When we start to lose our discernment and when we say we're too busy for the responsibility of being a child of God, we come complacent and we sit there in the midst of our sin and never affect the change that God wants us to change. I want to just say this. God calls us every day. We no longer have to make sacrifices with goats and rams. We no longer have to go to Eli or to any high priest because Christ is our high priest. When Christ died on the cross at Calvary, that veil was rent from top to bottom, allowing us to come into the very holy of holies, that we would have access to Almighty God, that we would be able to say and cry out, Abba, Father, Father, hear me, Father. We would be able to rely on the relationship that we have with our Holy Father. You know, there's an interesting story when you finish reading the book of First Samuel. <coughs> there were many battles, you know, and uh, with the Philistines. And one time, the Philistines came and took the Ark of the Covenant. They defeated Israel. Israel thought, well, we'll just bring out the Ark of the Covenant and God will protect us. But they weren't following God. They weren't uh, disciples of the Lord. They weren't looking to God for help every day of their life. They weren't listening for the voice of God. So God just stepped back and let them let them take all uh, take over Israel. They they went into captivity, and the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant. But God will not be mocked. So they take the Ark of the Covenant, and then they don't know what to do with it. Now the Ark of the Covenant has the very presence of God. So they got this Ark of the Covenant. They don't know what to do with it. So they bring it one place, and everybody in the town gets hemorrhoids. That's really what it was. They were called tumors. But when you go back, they were actually called hemorrhoids. So they go, no, we don't want this here. And they bring the Ark of the Covenant somewhere else. And those people are are affected with another dilemma, uh, physical malady of some sort. Finally, they take it. They have no place to put it. So they bring it to the uh, temple. (coughs) Excuse me of the god dragon and they put it there and this is supposed to be this big huge powerful there was this big huge um, statue of this god there right so they go okay well we'll put it there nobody will be hurt and it'll be safe there so they put the ark of the covenant in this pagan temple the next morning they wake up and this big huge statue is falling down in front of the ark of the covenant right so they go, oh, must must have been the wind. But it was this big, huge rock, these solid uh, uh, statue. So they raise up this, it takes all these guys to raise up this statue back up, right? And they go, okay, all right, we're all set, okay. The next day they come down, the, 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 uh, <laughs> the statue is on his face again before the ark, right? They go, get this out of here, bring it back to Israel. We have no place for this ark in the, in the land of the Philistines. It's a great story, you've got to read this, this is good stuff. God is calling us. He wants us to wake up. Now we have, last week I talked about the Logos, the Word of God, the Logos, the Rhema, the Word of God, the powerful Holy Spirit Word of God, the Logos, the written Word of God that helps us, the Logos keeps us on track, the Rhema gives spirit to the written word that we would have a, a word of God that is both not only written but active, alive, able to do great things in our lives. Today I'm telling you that the word of God, if we don't submit ourselves to the word of God, it becomes in, in, uh, uh, inactive in our lives. And we walk around really like a shallow grave, really with no power, dead and not able to fulfill all that God has called for us saying that we are we are um, uh, uh, Christians saying that we love the Lord but we don't have the power we don't have the, the, the 
vision. We've lost our hearing. We're trying to get through a world where God has given us the gift to be able to hear him directly. He's given us the opportunity to draw near. We don't need anybody else. We draw near with him because he loves us. That relationship that is so amazing. And we have a deaf ear to the one who died on the cross for us, the one who loves us more than anything else in the world, who longs for a relationship with us. We have deafened our ears. La, 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 la. And God is speaking. I want to challenge us this week. I want you to know that when God calls your name, it always requires a response. God always requires a response. I'm not telling you we have to go out and do something. Understand the difference. But there is a response. Samuel hears the voice of the Lord. Once he knew it was the voice of the Lord, and and Eli kind of instructed him what to say and who to say it to, God took care of the rest. He had someone who loved him, who walked, who came to him and wanted to serve him. God took care of the rest. When we come to God as a child, when we come to and say, whatever you want, Lord, what is it you want? What do you want me to do? And we ju- and he just does it. Uh, Elijah, I said to Elijah this, this afternoon, I said, Elijah, could you give me a cup in the back? I said, yes, Pastor. We had got a cup, brought it back. When we have that heart that says, I'm going to go, Lord, wherever you send me. I'm going to say whatever you want me to say. Keep my ears keen in what you need me to say and how I need to say it how my attitude is how I'm not looking around or being distracted from your purpose in my life when we have that that's the response it's the attitude of the heart not in the doing it's in the heart's response is your heart to do whatever God has called you to do today is it in mine am I ready to do whatever he calls me to do Yes, Lord. Whatever. 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 I don't know how, but whatever. It requires a response. We can't just put it on a back burner somewhere, like some committee that we sit on. Well, we'll put that on the back burner. You know, that's not on our dashboard. Those are buzzwords now. It's not on our dashboard this week. Put it on the back burner. No, there's no back burner with God. It requires that we respond, yes, Lord. If we want to hear from God, if we want to hear from God, it will always bring about change. It can help but change. It is the word from the very throne of God. When God speaks to us, that brings about a change in our life, in the people that surround us, in the circumstances that surround us, in our work, in our families. It will bring about a change. And sometimes it might rough the waters. I'm not saying it won't. But hang on. Jesus changed the course of humanity. Every place Jesus went, there was change. Some accepted him, some some didn't respect him, some didn't want to know anything about him. But whatever it was, there was always a change going on when Jesus walked into town. Something was about to happen. It's exciting being a member of the family of God. Every place we go, something's going to happen. And we've been graced to be there for it. We might even be the catalyst for it. The last thing I want to just say to you is this. When we hear the voice of God, God will always provide a shelter for us. Sometimes we let the voice of the enemy say, Oh, brother, we're going to be in trouble now. You know, Uncle Fred didn't want to hear that about Jesus. He only wants to talk about Donald Trump. He just didn't want to hear about Jesus. I want to tell you something. God will always protect us. He will always. Now, he may, it might not protect you the way you want to be protected. But that's all right. He promises that he'll keep you under the pinion of his wing. So if you are listening to the voice of God, and you're obeying the voice of God, and the, 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 
earthquake starts to happen, relax. He's got you. He knows that you've been obedient. He knows that you've been listening. He knows that the, that the earthquake is about to start, but he's got you on solid ground. It may be going crazy all about you, but you stand on the ground that God has given you, and you'll be protected. As we, as we face this week, and I apologize for my voice, I know, but I felt so strong that I wanted to share this word with you today. As we face this, we cannot limit our responsibility to the Lord. The Lord's calling us the same way he calls Samuel. He's calling Julie, Julie, Ben, Ben, Victoria, Victoria, Michelle, Michelle, Hei Jing, Hei Jing, Sue, Sue, Patty, Patty, Daniel, 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 quadruplet. What will our response be? We will never see God working unless we hear his voice. Unless we close out the things that are, that are keeping us from hearing him. I, I wanna, I'm gonna close with a, with a scripture. Let me just go to Hebrews. right at the very beginning of the book of Hebrews. Long ago, God spoke to the fathers by the prophets at different times and in different ways. In these days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, and through him he made the universe. He, he's talking about Jesus here, he is the radiance of his glory, the exact expression of his nature, and he sustains all things by his powerful word. After after making purification for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, so he became higher in rank than even the angels, just as the name he inherited is superior to theirs. God has given us Jesus. He is our Lord, our Savior, our all. People don't get it. This morning I opened up some old mail that came in and it's a, it's a Christmas card we got. And it says, Be peace, love, and joy from all of us. And I don't want to necessarily share where it came from. but And then you open it up. The greeting for this Christmas card says this. When words are both true and kind, they can change the world. Guess who said that? Buddha. (laughs) In our Christmas card from Buddha. (laughs) People don't get it. You know? It's Buddha is in our Christmas card. How will they ever know? How will they ever see? How will they ever change? How will they ever be saved? How will they know if we don't share it? How will they know if we're continually living in the, in the, in the glory of our wallet or the glory of our family or that we don't go outside for fear? We don't want to look like idiots or jerks and so we, we say nothing? This is on us. This isn't on the world. This is on us. We as Christians haven't done our job. They don't know. They've never heard. I pray that someone will bring the word of God to this group. And then they'll know. And they'll understand. It's on us. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand. Lord God, Forgive us. Forgive us because we allow our, our eyes to drift, our ears to not hear. Forgive us we get caught up in our own lives and our own problems. Forgive us because we don't, we have not inclined our ear to your word as you call us. Father, we pray, Almighty God, that you would open the eyes of our hearts, the ears of our hearts, Lord, that we would see with your eyes and hear with your ears, and Lord, that we would commit ourselves to follow only you. 
every god is going to fall at your feet the same way it did in Samuel every high place is going to be made low because you are God and we serve a risen God Father I pray that you would be with us that you would show us Lord and be patient with us as we change Father we know that the only way we're going to hear from you is by being in the right position to hear from you so Lord I pray that you encourage us to spend that time in disciplined prayer with you every day, Lord, so that you would be able to speak to us and we would be in a position to hear you, Lord, and our heart would be in a position to follow you and that we would not doubt, that we wouldn't look around and see who was watching, but, Lord, that we would have the strength of our convictions, Lord, to follow you no matter what the cost. Father, we ask for forgiveness for the times that we haven't been there. And Father, we pray that you would give us the opportunity this week to be there, to hear your word, and to follow you. Father, we thank you.